When we awakened this morning, today became a reality to us. Just as yesterday and the days before became a reality. Tonight, when the clock strikes midnight, tomorrow will become a reality. But just as each of these days become a reality to us, we must realize the reality of another day. That is the day of judgment. Judgment is going to be a real day, a day that lies at some point in the future for each and every one of us. Now there are some who believe that we will each have an individual judgment day. And here's what I mean by that. They believe that when we pass from this life, that on the day of our death, we will have our judgment at that time. But then we will be required to remain in paradise or in torment until the last day when Jesus comes again and then we will receive either our eternal reward or our eternal punishment. But the Bible plainly teaches that the day of judgment is going to be a universal day. It is a day when everyone will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And while we know that this day lies in the future, we don't know when it's going to be. Jesus does not know when it's going to be. The angels in heaven do not know when it is going to be. Folks, it could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be a hundred years. It could be a thousand years from now. We do not know when the day of judgment is going to take place. But we do know that it will. We do know that it will occur. It will become a reality just as real as today. Judgment Day is going to be a final day as we know days. For when the day of judgment comes, the earth and all the elements thereof will melt away with fervent heat. Well, our understanding of time with our 24-hour days, folks, that is an element of this life. That is an element of this earth. But when we hear the Lord say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of the Lord Folks, we will enter into the land of fadeless day, a place where there is no night, a place where God himself is the light. But the day of judgment will also be a day of revelation. For on the day of judgment, it will finally be revealed to us where we will spend eternity. We will finally have presented to us from the mouth of Christ how we lived our life. In their eyes, from their understanding and from their observation, how we did at living this Christian life. But also, it will be a day of revelation in that all of the questions that we've ever had about what heaven's going to be like, they're all going to be answered. We will know what heaven's going to be like because we will then be residents of that place. That will be our eternal habitation. All of those questions will finally be answered. Brethren, on that day, I'm going to be there. You're going to be there. But what does the Bible reveal to us about that day? Well, Hebrews 9 and verse 27 says, It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Brethren, the day of judgment is a day of certainty. There's no question about it. We will face that day. And multiple inspired writers reveal that fact to us. But also we're told in Acts 17 and verse 31, Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Notice what that says. It says that the day of judgment is an appointed day. Just as we have appointments in this life that we intend to keep, the day of judgment is an appointment that we will keep. God has scheduled that appointment for us. And it will be one that we will not be able to cancel. It will be one that we will not be able to reschedule. It will be one that we must face. 
Mark 13, verses 32 through 33, says of this occasion, But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, know not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when that time is. Notice what this says. It says that not Jesus, not the Holy Spirit, not the angels, there is not anyone with the exception of God who knows what that date's going to be. Who knows when this appointment is going to be expected of us to be fulfilled. It's kind of like whenever you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you that you need to have a certain type of procedure or a surgery, something of that nature, but they don't tell you when that date's going to be. They're just going to work you in. And then they call you and they let you know when that's going to be. Well, oftentimes you have to drop things at a moment's notice and you have to go because that's when the appointed time is. Or you think about a woman who is with child when the pains of labor start. You drop everything and you go. That's the appointed time. Well, that's how it's going to be with the day of judgment. We don't know when it's going to be, but we will know when it's here. We will know when that time comes. And there's not going to be any other chances. There's not going to be any opportunities to change at that point. Folks, Jesus will come. The dead in Christ will rise first. Those who are alive and remain will then be caught up together in the clouds. Then the earth and all the elements thereof are going to be dissolved. They will melt away with fervent heat and each and every one of us will have our time before that judgment seat of Christ. Everything is going to happen in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, everything's going to change. And this reality... Everything that we are familiar with, it's going to be gone. And we will go to be in the presence of the Lord. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. The day of judgment is going to be all-inclusive. Now there are some around us that, that like this idea of what they call annihilationism. And what that says is that if you pass from this life and you are unsaved whenever you die, that that's it. That your soul is, is taken away from you and that you no longer have any existence whatsoever. Well, you know what? That sounds pretty good to an extent because that completely removes the concept of punishment. But the scriptures tell us that that's not how it's going to happen. The day of judgment is going to be a universal day. There is not going to be anyone that will be excluded from the day of judgment. Paul says that we will all have our time and it will be presented to us how we lived our life. We will give an account of those things, whether it's been good, whether it's been bad. We have to give an account of those things. And you know, I find myself from time to time stopping and considering, what would I say? I mean, I'm sure that we're going to have some help. We're going to talk about that here in just a little bit when we talk about the books being open. We're going to have some help remembering those things. But if you were standing before the judgment seat of Christ today, and Christ told you, tell me about your life, how'd you do? What would you be able to say? What would you say? Where would you start? I don't know. I don't know. But we do know that it's going to be a day of accountability. Romans 14 verses 10 through 12 says, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For as it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Folks, we have an epidemic in the world around us today of people who do not want to accept responsibility. People will go to great lengths to try to pass the blame off onto somebody else. We don't like to admit that we're wrong. We don't like to admit that we make mistakes. But we don't have a problem at all letting someone else accept that for us. But folks, on the day of judgment, we're not going to be able to do that. 
On the day of judgment, we're not going to be able to pass the blame. We will accept the way that we've lived our life. We will accept the good. We will accept the bad. Now, there may be things that we don't want revealed. There may be things in this life that we don't want anybody to know about. But they're going to be known on that day. In Hebrews 4 and verse 13 it says, All things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Folks, while we may have things that we don't want people to know about, while we may be engaged in certain sinful behaviors that we're able to keep hidden from people in this life, on the day of judgment we will be accountable for those things. Those things will be made known to us. They will be revealed to us and we will accept those things. There's no getting around it. It is a day of accountability. Everybody's going to be there. All nations of the earth, everyone that has lived in every dispensation of time down from Adam all the way down to the last man, they will all be there. Everyone will face the same judgment, will face the same standard. There's no partiality with God. God's not going to view anyone on a higher level than anyone else. No one's going to be more privileged than another. We all stand equal in the sight of God. On that day, we will have equal opportunities. We could say it's an equal opportunity judgment. We all have the same opportunities. We all have the opportunity to go to heaven. But on the same hand, we also have the opportunity to be lost. But it's up to us to determine what that destiny is going to be. Based upon how we live our life. Jesus gives us a picture of this in Matthew 25 verses 31 and 33. It says, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Notice that it says that in this division, there's only going to be two divisions. There's going to be the righteous, there's going to be the unrighteous. The righteous are going to go to heaven. The unrighteous are going to go to eternal condemnation. But only Jesus has the ability to determine who goes into which group. Jesus is the judge. He is the one that will divide the righteous from the unrighteous. But think about this. While the day of judgment, it's not the most pleasant subject to think about. But on the other hand, it's a glorious day. For on that day, those who have lived a life of righteousness, those who have been faithful to God, they will be separated eternally from all things evil, all things wicked, and will live forever in a place of perfect goodness and grace. You know, as the song says, what a day, glorious day that's going to be. That's a day I look forward to. That's a day every Christian should be eager to experience. But in determining who goes into which group, Revelation 20 and verse 12 tells us that John saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Have you ever wondered what these books are? Have you ever wondered what is contained in these books? Well, back in the mid-1800s, Alexander Campbell wrote an article in which he was expounding upon Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12. And he suggested that there are possibly six books that could be opened on the Day of Judgment. And those six books that he suggested 
could be these. The book of nature, the book of God's remembrance, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the record of our works, and the book of life. For the remainder of our lesson this morning, I'd like to examine each one of these six books and determine what and if they will play a part on the day of judgment. Let's start with the book of nature. You know, the Bible tells us a lot about nature, tells us a lot about the way that things work and how nature declares the glory of God. You know, Psalm 19 verses 1 and 2 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. You now, that sounds a lot like a book, doesn't it? Romans 1 and verse 20 says, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So it tells us here that God has revealed himself to us, has revealed himself to man by way of his creation. How many times have we heard preachers say or people comment the fact that you go out and you look at nature and you can't help but uh, appreciate and see the presence of God, the handiwork of God. That's what he's talking about here. God's creation declares his existence to us. But then we notice in Acts 14 and verse 17 it says, Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness, in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and with gladness. Yes, the book of nature reveals many things to us. It reveals to us the existence of God, reveals to us the power of God, reveals to us the prominence of God. But there's something missing from the book of nature. There's no salvation in the book of nature. There's no forgiveness to be found in the book of nature. The book of nature does not reveal Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. The book of nature does not reveal a plan of salvation to us. And while there are many things that we can learn from the book of nature, I do not believe that it will be one present on the day of judgment. But then we come to our second book, the book of God's remembrance. We go back into the Old Testament and we go to the prophet Malachi. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6, it is recorded, Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. So a book of remembrance was written before God. Things that God uses to call to his remembrance. The things that he said, the promises that he has made. Then we go to the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 30 verses 8 and 9 it says, Now go, write it before them on a tablet, and note it on a scroll, that it may be for time to come forever and ever. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children who will not hear the law of the Lord. Now notice that this book is not just a book of remembrance of the things that God has said, but it is also a book of remembrance of the things that God has done for us, but also our response to it. It calls to God's remembrance those things that need to be preserved, those things that need to be present that we need to give an account of. But then we see Paul writing in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 5. He says, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. Then each one's praise will come from God. Folks, the book of God's remembrance is continuing to be written. The things that we do in this life, whether they're good or bad, they're being written into the book of God's remembrance. And those are things that are going to be brought to light, going to be revealed on the day of judgment. The book of God's remembrance is going to be opened. And our life is going to be compared with what is written therein according to the law that we're living under. But we also need to remember 
that there are some things that can be taken away from the book of God's remembrance. When we become a child of God, when we repent of our sins, those things that are written in the book of God's remembrance that are sinful things, they're blotted out. They're taken away. Our slate is wiped clean. And guess what remains? The good things. The positive things. The things that will speak well for us on the day of judgment. Folks, we truly serve a great and good God. A just God. A God who does not want anyone to perish. A God who doesn't want to remember the bad things. He wants to take those things away. He gives us every opportunity to have those things taken away. But when that book of God's remembrance is opened on the day of judgment, what do you want God to remember about you? What do you want to be written there next to your name? Then we have the Old Testament. Folks, of all of these six books that we mentioned this morning, the greatest continuing witness of God is the Bible. The Old Testament continues to be the most impressive witness to the deity of God, to the Godhead of Christ, to the nature of God, His dealings with man. It proves to us by way of prophecy the credentials of Christ, who we need to be looking for, why Jesus is the one that we need to place our faith in. The Old Testament is a very important body of Scripture to us today. It teaches us so much. It's a schoolmaster. It helps us to see more clearly the things that are in the New Testament. But also we find that the Old Testament contains two laws. It contains the patriarchal law and it contains the law of Moses. And those who were alive during the time that those laws were enforced, guess what book's going to be opened? The Old Testament's going to be opened. Their life, that which is contained in God's book of remembrance, is then going to be compared with the law that was enforced when they lived. They're going to be judged based upon either their faithfulness to that law or their rejection of that law. Therefore, the Old Testament will be opened on the day of judgment. But not everyone will be judged according to it. Because we also have the New Testament. Matthew 7 and verse 24, and also Matthew 7 and verse 26, tells us that the New Testament contains the sayings of Christ. And that we are expected to live according to the commands which He delivered to us first in his earthly ministry, but then later on by way of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. These are the things that are binding upon us today. These scriptures are those which teach us how to be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It contains the new law, the law that is in effect today. Each and every one of us are living under this Christian dispensation. And Jesus tells us in John 12 and verse 48 that it is this word, these words contained in the New Testament that will judge us on the last day. So when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the New Testament will be opened. We will be judged according to the things that are contained therein. Next we have the record of our works. This book kind of goes hand in hand with the book of God's remembrance. But whenever we think of the record of our works... The Bible is filled with references showing us that we will be judged according to how we live our life. In John 5, verses 26 through 29, Jesus said, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. But marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of condemnation. But also we must remember that when we depart from this life, there's only one thing we're going to take with us. Think about that. When we die, there's only one thing that we take with us. 
Jesus reveals that to us in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13 where he says, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, they may rest from their labors and what? Their works do follow them. These works follow us for they will be examined on the day of judgment. And then lastly we have the book of life. Other than one reference in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 3, every reference that we have to the book of life is found in the book of Revelation. And I think there's a reason for that. This concept of life was one that was meant to encourage Christians. And whenever you think of the purpose of the book of Revelation, Revelation was written to encourage Christians who were facing heavy persecution from the Roman authorities. And so whenever it was presented unto them that God has a book of life, that your name can be written in the book of life, even if it means that you must lay down your physical life for your faith, guess what? You still have life. You have life in Christ, in the life that is to come. Why? Because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. That's an encouragement. That strengthened those early Christians as they were facing such a hard time. Whenever we consider the scripture reading that Brother Wayne shared with us this morning in Revelation 20, verses 12 through 15, Jesus revealed to John an image of judgment. He said he was standing there and he saw the dead, both small and great, standing there before the judgment seat of Christ, and I'm paraphrasing, and books were opened. And another book was opened, and it was the book of life. Now listen to this. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Folks, you know what that means? It means that if our name is not in the Lamb's book of life, it does not matter what these other books say. If our name is not in the Lamb's book of life, we will not go to heaven. We will be lost for eternity. Only those whose names are written there will be granted access into heaven. Revelation 21 and verse 27 says, And there shall be no wise, or shall in no wise enter into it, referring to heaven, anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Brethren, on the day of judgment, the book of life will be opened. And if your name is found in the Lamb's book of life, you will go to heaven. If your name is written there, heaven will be your home. But if not, you will be condemned. But the question we have to ask ourselves this morning is this. Is our name written there? If you're a faithful Christian, you can have the confidence of knowing your name's there. It's in that book of life. And as long as you remain faithful to God, it's going to stay in that book of life. That book's going to be opened on the day of judgment. And Jesus is going to say, yep, there's Josh. There's Joey. There's Carol. They're children of God. They're faithful. Well done. Well done, good and faithful servants. Enter into the joys of the Lord. Our name is placed in the Lamb's book of life when we become a child of God. When we place our faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, we repent of our sins, we confess that faith and are baptized into Christ. Not only are we added to the church, our name is added to the book. And so long as we continue to walk in the light as He is in the light, the blood of Christ will continue to cleanse us of our sins and our name will remain in the book of life. But this morning, if your name is not there, why not get it there? 
Why not make that decision today? That you're going to do what you have to do in order to be sure of your salvation. Obey those steps in the plan of salvation that I just shared with you. Have your name added to the book. Or maybe you are a child of God, but you've strayed away and your name's been removed from the book of life. You know what? It can be added back. Be restored this morning if that's the situation that you find yourself in. This morning, if you examine yourself and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, we encourage you to come while we stand and sing.